this is an Okay, members, you're all very welcome to a meeting of the Justice no. Committee, and uh, we will make a start. Um, feel free to use electronic devices um, in terms of them being connected to Wi-Fi, but if you can silent them, that would be appreciated, and just keep them away from any of the microphones. And um, we'll be deliberating on the domestic abuse bill, and that will be reported by Hansard in accordance with the normal protocol. Um, just at this stage, members, again, if there's any declarations of financial or other relevant interests to today's proceedings, now is the time to declare it. Not will proceed. Apologies. None have been received, and Paul Fru is going to be joining us shortly. Um, I think Shania Bradley is trying to, to join us through the Starleaf uh, facility. Draft minutes of the meeting that were held on the 3rd of September, pages 3 to 12 of the table pack. Um, members are content that they are a true reflection of proceedings, then I will sign them accordingly. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Matters arising, two items um, just arising. One relates to the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill. Um, Pages 6 to 20 of the meeting pack. Informal meetings were held with four individuals before the summer recess to discuss their experiences of domestic abuse to help the committee's consideration of the bill. Draft notes of the informal meetings were subsequently prepared and uh, were shared with those individuals. Um, three of the individuals have confirmed that they are content with the draft notes, and these have been included in the meeting pack for your information. A response from the fourth individual has not yet been received. Two of the individuals who met with the committee subsequently provided additional written information, and these are attached to the notes of the relevant informal uh, meeting. Uh, the remaining in informal meetings will be held over the next two weeks, and details will be circulated to members um, once the arrangements have been uh, made. The committee received uh, 41 written submissions from individuals in response to its call for evidence on the bill, and a summary of the key issues raised in the submissions from individuals are included in pages 19 and 20 of uh, the meeting pack. So, if members can note uh, the notes of those informal meetings and the summary of the written submissions from individuals, which can then be drawn upon as required to inform committee deliberations on the bill. Um, other items, just the forward work programme, pages 21 to 24, um, in terms of the plan for September. The details are there, and it is for members uh, to note. Um, the Chief Constable is uh, coming to the committee, albeit, I think, through the, um, the online broadcast facilities, uh, on the 24th of September to update us on European Union exit issues and, obviously, other issues. Um, may be raised and if members are wanting to, to have issues raised if they can notify Christine um, and at least then the Chief Constable can be given advance notice, albeit members are obviously at liberty to ask questions on the day as they see fit, um, but if there are things that you would like to, to provide to the committee clerk in advance of that meeting, please do so. Item 4 then is the Domestic Abuse and Family Proceedings Bill, our informal deliberations in respect of that. You have a separate brief for me. Yeah, <clears throat> We're just seeing if she needed hasn't been able to join in just yet. Um, we'll, we'll proceed, members, while that gets looked at. Pages 26 to 306 of the meeting pack are the relevant papers, and in particular, if I can draw members' attention to the clerk's memo, which are on pages uh, 26 to 31. Um, the Departmental and PSNI officials attended the meeting last week to discuss the issues that were raised in the evidence received on the bill and to answer members' questions during the evidence session. The officials agreed to provide further information on a number of issues, and that was requested for the meeting today. Um, a Hansard of the oral evidence session uh, was received yesterday and is at pages 14 to 32 of the table pack, and I think um, responses came from the department this morning, so there's hard copies have been provided for members 
um, which followed up on the information uh, that we had uh, requested at last week's meeting. So it, it was received just this morning, so it hadn't been emailed to members, but a hard copy is provided. So, members, we're going to go through the informal deliberations on the clauses of the bill and the department's proposed uh, amendments. The informal deliberations, as we've discussed, provide an opportunity for members to discuss the issues that have been raised, indicate whether they are content with the clauses and the proposed amendments, um, require any further information or clarification, um, albeit there's a very narrow window to get that. Um, and where members wish to amend particular clauses that have been prepared by in the bill, uh, or indeed are minded to reject particular clauses, and if members need more time to consider a particular clause or clauses, the committee can continue the deliberations uh, next week. Okay. So, when accepting a clause or amendment, members can express views, uh, they can make comments, uh, and the committee can also make then recommendations. For example, with regard to the implementation of or outworking of a clause, and then that can be reflected in the committee report uh, on the bill. And if the committee is minded to make amendments to any of the clauses, the purpose and desired outcome of the amendment uh, needs to be clarified. The committee then uh, may wish to write to the minister asking whether she accepts the proposed change and will table amendment alternatively. Uh, or indeed at the same time, the committee can ask for a draft amendment to be prepared by the bill clerk uh, for its consideration. And the bill clerk, uh, Stephanie Mallon, uh, is in attendance at the meeting uh, to listen to the committee's deliberations. And the, if the committee does wish to draft any uh, amendments um, to be prepared, then she can participate in the meeting and provide advice and seek clarification of the purpose of the proposed amendment if that's necessary. Um, given advice from the bill clerk, to a committee takes place in closed session. This will happen at the end of the deliberations rather than during them, in case there is more than one proposed amendment to discuss. So hopefully members um, were clear on that. Obviously next week is where we will look at the broader amendments um, that some people have wanted that aren't currently in the bill. So this is uh, in respect to the clauses that are on the current bill as provided by the department and please do feel free to, to provide comment um, because that will help inform the uh, committee report which is then obviously going to be relied upon whenever we take this into the assembly um, and, and it is important that it's referenced at this stage members uh, views on it and Sinead you're, you're welcome to the meeting we're just we're just going to start the, the clause by clause informal consideration at this stage, so uh, you haven't missed anything of import just yet. Okay, clauses one to four, and um, clause one sets out the domestic abuse offence. Clause two sets out what constitutes the abusive behaviour for the purposes of the offence, and clause three provides that for the offence to be committed. It is not necessary to prove that the behaviour actually causes the partner or connected persons to suffer physical or psychological harm, or that the effects of the behaviour actually caused harm, but rather it is sufficient that a reasonable person would consider that the behaviour would be likely to result in harm. Clause 4 sets out what is meant by behaviour for the purpose of the legislation and how it can be carried out. So the key issues that have been raised in relation to, the, to these clauses uh, and the evidence that we have received and indeed that we discussed with officials last week um, covered whether the definition of domestic abuse is needed in the legislation, whether the scope of the offence is so broad that it dilutes the key aspects of domestic abuse and the seriousness of the offence, whether key terms such as psychological harm, harm and reckless are clear enough or require further definition either in the legislation or the guidance to be provided by the department, whether the description of abusive behaviour is adequate or whether the term coercive control should be included, whether the new offence as currently drafted captures uh, parental alienation, deliberate abuse of child contact orders and spiritual abuse and reference to these in the guidance uh, being helpful. Uh, the need for the provision to provide for prosecutions where no actual harm has been caused and whether there are likely to be obstacles to such prosecutions, 
uh, and whether the definitional uh, lines in the bill are correct or whether the bar of criminality has been set too low, potentially leading to the unintentional criminalisation of behaviour and wrong cases being prosecuted given the wide personal uh, connection. So, members, that covers, as far as I am aware, the broad issues that we have considered, and obviously we have the Department's responses in respect of that. So, at this stage, I am going to invite members' views in respect of clauses 1, 2, 3 and 4, and in respect of those issues. Are there any comments members wish to make? Linda? Just one of the issues that was raised by Women's Aid was about having a um, specific gender de de definition in, in the bill. Now, I haven't really heard an argument as to how that would strengthen the bill. I'm, I'm not opposed to it, but I think that unless it's going to strengthen the bill, because obviously we have heard from groups and organisations that will also outline, and particularly given the fact that we have quite a broad scope around who would be included in this, to, to have a gender definition might actually hinder that mm. side of it. So I would have a wee bit of concern around that. There's, there's no doubt that most of the victims in relation to domestic abuse are female, and most of the per perpetrators, even where it's, even where the victim is male, most of the perpetrators are male. So, I mean, y you could potentially, on that basis, say that there should be a gender definition there. But unless it's actually going to strengthen the the bill itself, then, and I haven't really heard an argument yet that would that would give sort of any. Um, Support to the fact that it would that it would strengthen the bill in any way. So, and I have some concerns, obviously, because of the fact that some groups and organisations have outlined the fact that there are male victims as well. So, I suppose that's the first thing. And just then, in relation to clause three, I think we had a fairly good conversation last week about um, why clause three is required. That there are many, many victims out there that don't realise either because of the length of time that they have been a victim, the be behaviour has become normalised or because of the fact that they are a vulnerable person um, and don't recognise what has happened to them as, as being abuse. So I think that Clause 3 actually is, is vital in relation to this bill, again particularly given that we have quite a wide scope of persons that um, we're covering in relation to it. And, and in the tabled information, um, Clause 3 is referenced because um, we that is an issue that we have talked about at, at length, uh, and the basis for that. Just if, if mobile phone can, can be taken away, there's interference, and Hansard is telling us that they're they're not picking up everything, and it is important that they do for the purposes of this report. So if you can just anyone that has a mobile, I don't think it's me. I'll, yeah, it's okay. Before I start rebuking other people. Um, okay. So yes. And, and, and those those issues as well we've considered around the definition and the gender issue um, and in all four of those clauses whenever I've looked at it myself given my own uh, party's view on this um, I'm content with the explanations that the department has given um, and the justification um, around how they, they, they view the bill operating um, Albeit, I note the concerns that others have raised. Um, Rachel, thanks, Chair. And I'm certainly picking up on Linda's point in clause three. Just the reflection of victims' experience that have, you know, come through the committee um, consultation, but also just in general, you know, that the re there is a reason for that being in there, and it was came very, very clear for the reason of being that in, in the Scottish legislation, because that's reflecting the, the reality of, of life for victims. And survivors of domestic abuse, um, so certainly would be really um, concerned if clause three was going to be removed, but it, would, it must be in there. But in terms of the, the definition, I know I brought up this clause one, I brought this up last week with regard to where the, because we're holding Scottish legislation as the gold standard and everything else is sort of being drawn from that, but ours has notable differences in terms of the scope. And whenever I was discussing that with the department, um, we said that it was reflecting the definition that was outlined in the strategy in 2016. But in terms of 
if, if we're basing a definition in our legislation on the de based on the definition of a strategy, is that the best way of doing it? Is you know is the strategy working in, as, as best as it could based on that definition? Um, so I'm just a wee bit of concern now that a definition in legislation is based on a strategy which is not legally defined and might not actually be based on the specific need as a remedy for a specific problem. And sort of just the rationale, I was trying to tease it out last week, but the rationale between the differences in Scotland and the Northern Irish legislation as it stands at the moment, I don't feel as if I've had enough information on why those differences are there. Is the, the definition, just so I check, um, is that around the personal connection? Yeah, it was, it's clause one. Um, clause one in the Scottish legislation has, sorry, I have it here, is, is abusive behaviour towards partner or ex-partner. Um, they constitute, what constitutes abusive behaviour is similar. Um, and it obviously has a reasonable person, you know, all, all of the stuff that we have in terms of recklessness, what they intend at the course of a behaviour, psychological harm, and referencing fear, alarm, distress. But the, the Scottish legislation is confined to partners and ex-partners. Um, ours, obviously, with the personal connection list, is, is a lot bigger. And that seems to be, according to the department last week, because of the definition of use of it through the domestic abuse and se domestic and sexual abuse strategy. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know where that came from. Where did that definition in the strategy come from? Um, as we were trying to get it out last week, is it from feedback from the task and finish groups? But I, I don't feel as if I got enough information with regard to that on clause one. Christine, do you want to just provide an outline of? the department's responses in respect of those issues around definition because they, they have been raised before by other groups just so that we can remind members of the department's responses to this. Yeah, I think um, there was an issue raised just generally about the fact that um, the bill didn't provide a, defini a definition of domestic abuse uh, specifically in the bill um, and in the department's written comments. Um, in response, they indicated that they had considered, in conjunction with core statutory and voluntary sector partners, whether to include a statutory definition of domestic abuse in the bill um, ahead of it being finalised. Following this, it was agreed that given the detail set out in the bill in relation to what constitutes abusive behaviour and therefore domestic abuse, that a standalone definition was unnecessary. And furthermore, to provide for a definition in the bill would not materially change the provisions or serve a legislative purpose purpose, given that any such provision would be likely to simply state domestic abuse means abusive behaviour as set out in clause 2. And then in relation to the wider um, definition in, and covering the personal connections, um, in response to Rachel um, last week when you, you raised this with the officials, they said um, essentially at its core it reflects what is in the seven year domestic and sexual abuse strategy. Within its scope, domestic abuse is deemed to cover both intimate relationships and family members. It also covers the approach that may be taken by police currently. That was the genesis of the coverage and why we are different from Scotland in that regard. Um, underpinning that is the seven-year strategy and its scope. Again, we were keen to ensure that the domestic abuse offence reflected what was in that strategy. To have done otherwise would have left the two vastly different. Um, and just if you bear with me, I think under clause five um, they said in considering the scope of family members the department was keen to ensure that the range was comprehensive but not so broad covering all possible family members that it would negatively and adversely impact upon what society and the courts consider to be domestic abuse in the context of committing an offense and the seriousness associated with it um, it is, however, more comprehensive than other regions in that family members and partners, form, former partners, do not have to live together for the offence to occur. Um, this also reflects the current police position whereby family members are deemed to include mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter, grandparents, in-laws or step-family, and both police and PPS have indicated their content with the current scope of the family member in the bill. 
Um, I'm just looking because I think there was something they said in developing the strategy. I know they developed the strategy in conjunction with all the key stakeholders, so the assumption would be the definition that was in the strategy was what was eventually agreed. So I know it's, it's an issue I had considered as well. Do we Is this being too broad that it then doesn't tackle the core of an issue? Um, and whenever I weighed it up then, I thought that, that'll mean I, do I end up excluding these other people that are already, that would then be covered by what were in the provisions, and it's, I suppose, striking that balance. Um, Linda? Just in, in relation to what you're saying there, Chair, I, I, I looked at the same and, and thought, you know, particularly as you had raised it last week, Rachel, and, and we discussed this during the week, and I suppose I felt that this potentially actually future-proofs the legislation because you could potentially be looking at having to create another piece of legislation for those other people if you excluded them from this piece and then balance it out against does it does it is the legislation weakened for its for its initial intent and that I do believe is around the, the partners and ex partners and I couldn't establish that, that it did weaken it weaken that. So I mean the police and the judiciary have all of the powers in relation to those relationships through this legislation. So that, that's kind of where how I came to the, the judgment that I don't, and, I, and I'm not hard and fast in this, I'm, I'm, I remain to be convinced, but I would be of the view at this time that including all of those relationships actually does future proof it in terms of not having to then come up with another piece of legislation for those other individuals. Okay, members. Um So I know, Rachel, you're asking around, um, notwithstanding the, the kind of concern about if it's, if it's too broad, will it be effective? But then, where where did it come from in the 2016 strategy? Yep. Um, and I, I'm happy that we would ask for that information. Um, but it's whether or not waiting on that information to hold back on an informal view as to whether or not the committee would support clauses 1, 2, 3 and 4. Um, I'm content that we proceed on with clauses one, two, three, and four. Um, if members are, are content, I mean, yeah, um, I would just be interested if, if it's sort of I mean, it should be a different way around, not basing definition of legislation on a strategy. Surely, a strategy should come from legislation, but maybe that's just my trying to yeah. trying to figure this out. Um, but if, and I, and I appreciate um, Linda's comments and your, yourself, Chair, um, other, there is a need for other legislation. Um, the Commissioner for Older People have raised it um, in terms of adult safeguarding. Um, we have the child protection legislation, the child order, and I note that there is a, an amendment um, been proposed by the department. Um, so I think there is still a need for additional pieces of legislation to cover other family relationships and abuse within family situations um, and you know abuse in any way is wrong um, and we need to be we need to be saying that in every piece of legislation but um, I do have concerns that this may water it down slightly in terms of the effectiveness especially if we're basing our legislation on Scotland because Scotland is so vastly different mm -hmm. and Scotland has been effective in the last year um, note there has been a report out on Tuesday um, on, on, on how much it's been used, um, but in it, it, is, it is sort of much more focused to address a specific concern of domestic abuse between partners, and that is where this has come from. Um, I'm not going to hold back on a committee position on, um, on clauses one to four based on that, but I do have concerns on how this could be enforced by uh, the judiciary and by the police and PPS in terms of its effectiveness and getting prosecutions, um, just based on if we're basing a, a definition on a strategy, which is obviously up for review every year and yeah. will need changed after this legislation comes in. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, we'll have the formal, you know, that will be on the record now in terms of your view around it, and then we will have a formal vote to take on it. Um, but I, I'm content, members, that we proceed, that 
the informal view of the committee is uh, that the committee um, at large is content to proceed with clauses one, two, three, and four. <coughs> We will just ask for that information around where it came from in the strategy in 2016 for, that, for the, the meeting whenever it comes to the formal consideration of the clause. I think that will be helpful. We will we'll, we'll try and get it for next week's meeting, and we are not doing formal clause by clause then anyway, so yeah. hopefully we will have it before that. Thank you. Okay. Clauses 5 and I uh, will take 18 because it deals with the personally connected, and we have touched on it there um, in terms of the personal connections and a family member. The, the key issues that were raised in relation to these clauses and the evidence and that we discussed with officials last week relate to whether personal connection as defined in the bill is wide enough, um, needs expanded further or needs narrowed. Um, so again, members, and maybe we have touched on it in the, in, in the last discussion, um, if there's any views that members wish to express in respect of, of those clauses 5 and 18. I'll take the previous comments around it that apply to, in terms of Rachel, the point that you had made around <coughs> the personal connection around that aspect of it. But are members content then with 5 and 18? Just, Chair, just the only thing is, obviously, it was raised with me from Voipec about the clarity on kinship and care and relationships. Obviously, that comes in under the um, parental responsibilities, but just to have that written into the legislation and um, where the, the department had said that it was there in the DSO's views that this type of relationship would be covered, but I would be interested to see that, um, that opinion, if possible. Okay. Sure. Just to Yes, right. to that same point. I, th I think that when the department have said that it would be covered, but they've specified step families. Why not? Why not specify, you know, foster families and, ad and adoptive families, kinship care, even. Um, I just think it would be it would be there. It would be in the legislation. It would ensure that those families are not excluded. Has that been covered by the department's response, Christine? Um, I think last week they did confirm that, in their view, that what was already in the bill would cover those relationships, but they obviously don't. Uh, they use the term affinity. Um, it doesn't specify mm -hmm. those particular terms. But they have specified step families, you know, yeah. and, and so why not then specify the the others? I mean, it's it's not a that's not asking for a big change. It should be fairly easy to do it. But it was something that I had. Noted as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's it. Clause eighteen five. A. Relationship of the half blood or by affinity is to be treated as a relationship. Yeah. So it's in that area. Members are asking as to whether or not we can have kinship specified in the legislation. Um. Okay. Um, just Chair, I think it was raised on. It was raised in the evidence whether affinity would cover relationships such as adoptive parent-child, foster parent-child, kinship care, child relationships in those cases, um, and the department said in their view they were covered, they fell within it. But I suppose it's just whether is it all of those the committee would like specified now or just. I suppose what I'm what I'm wondering is is it the removal of the word affinity to be replaced with a detailed list of what affinity is understood to cover, um, or is or there is a danger of removing us? affinity that it maybe doesn't capture something? I suppose would be my issue that I would like to know. Yeah, and, and if affinity, I, I, I suppose it's about establishing where does that come from? Where does their understanding of what affinity means come from? So is there something there written down about what affinity is exactly? So does it, you know, around those kind of relationships? That, that's what I would like to probably yeah. have because I, I, I understand your concerns, Chair. By, by taking out affinity, do you then potentially leave somebody out if you, yeah. if you start listing everybody? So I, I mean, I have no issue if we can establish 
Okay, well, if, yeah, mm. if members are content, then we can ask the department uh, where does their understanding of affinity come yeah. from, um, and is there any reason why they can't specify those relationships that I listed there mm -hmm. um, on the face of the bill? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so in clauses five and eighteen, then we're content. Um, on the other aspects of it, and we'll seek clarity on the one area around affinity and whether that covers the expansive areas that it should cover and if there's a need to specify it or is there any objection to it being specified in the legislation. Um, and then we can come back to that particular aspect on, the, on Clause 18. Okay. Okay, clauses 6 and 19. This provides that in relation to the matter of two individuals being personally connected, the prosecutor may serve notice proposing that this is taken as established unless the personal connection is challenged. Um, one minor suggestion was made in the evidence received relating to the drafting of the clause, and the department responded indicating that legislatively... Uh, it was considered unnecessary. Members, any comments on 6 and 19? You're content? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, clauses 7 and 20. This was about how notice is to be served um, in relation. So, clauses 7 and 20 provides for the service of notices in relation to clause 6 for the purpose of challenging that a relationship is to be taken as established and gives clarity in relation to what is meant by certain terms. A number of minor suggestions were made in the evidence. The department responded, indicating that these could be dealt with operationally. The department advised that it understands the uh, concern raised by Women's Aid around the service of notices uh, relates to protection orders and notification of those to victims rather than the service of the new notices relating to the personal relationship being challenged. Okay, members, it's whether or not there's any views on 7 and 20 around how notices to be served. Content. See that. Okay. Um, clause eight provides for aggravation of the domestic abuse offence where the person is in the relationship is under the age of eighteen. The aggravation applies where it is shown that at any time in committing the offence, it has been committed against someone that was under the age of eighteen. Key issues raised. Uh, included the NSPCC's view that the offence should only apply where A and B are over 16, the need for a full review of the family courts, including a review of the duty to protect. Um, other vulnerabilities should be considered as aggravating factors and the need to ensure that young people are not punished unduly harshly, for example, in a case where both perpetrator and the victim are 17 years old and in a relationship and there's no evidence of the abuser taking advantage of the victim's young age. So, members, if there are any views around clause eight, Linda. it's obviously taken on board some of the concerns that have been raised. But I, I certainly can't think of how you would amend the clause to to take in those concerns necessarily. And I haven't heard any suggestions around how you might do that either, whilst the concerns have been raised. So, I think that the protections that are in place, you know, at the minute around that there wouldn't be any, I suppose, undue harshness mm -hmm. in relation to young people, you would like to think would, would be enough in terms of the, the PPS and the PS9 judiciary and how they would actually approach it. So I, I just, as I say, I, I understand the concerns and I have some of them myself, but you could say that you could have those concerns from both sides of the argument, you know, some concerns from both sides of the argument rather. And I just don't see how you would amend the clause. And as I say, I don't have, I haven't heard any suggestions as to how it would be amended or changed to make to take in those concerns or to address those concerns. 
Christine, do you want to just reference the departments, how it responded and dealing with those concerns, just so we have that noted? Sure. Um, just looking. Um, I think in their written response, they have said that um, while appreciating concerns expressed, um, they say it is important that the offence is available in cases of domestic abuse um, and the aggravation. Um, they're saying that, as with all other offences, in deciding whether to charge a young person, consideration will be given to the circumstances of the case, whether the test for public prosecution, including public interest test, is met, and what alternative disposals may be available. Uh, youth Justice Agency staff are trained to recognise and respond to issues of domestic abuse in all its forms, whether a child is a victim or perpetrator, and they are required to negotiate the procedural and process requirements of both the justice and safeguarding systems as the impact on children and adults while supporting service users. Specialist interventions are delivered as part of community or court order disposals, often in collaboration with other statutory and voluntary organisations. And the experience in other jurisdictions are that the number of young people charged with an offence has been relatively low. Um, they are saying they understand that in Scotland, for example, around 1.5% of those reported and prosecuted were under the age of 18. While in England and Wales, they understand that only two individuals under the age, age of 18 have been convicted. So children and young people are covered by the offence in two ways, where they are in a relationship or a family member, except where parental responsibility applies. So I, I was content to go with how that was being addressed by the department, notwithstanding the issue that had been raised by an SPCC. Uh, just to highlight, I think we'll, we'll come on to it um, in one of the later clauses, but they have also highlighted that they are discussing with colleagues in the Department of Health around a possible amendment to child protection provisions to mm -hmm. ensure that um, there's adequate protection for a child who is ill-treated. Um, I think we'll cover it in another later on, slightly later in clause 9 or 11. So they're looking at that amendment to make sure the child protection legislation um, is satisfactory. Okay. okay, members. Um, Chair, just on that potential amendment, do we have any further information about what that is with the Department of Health? Is it it's not what it looks like? This one? Um, they no, it's that one I think you have, 12A, which relates to not this area. Um, we haven't got it yet. It's in the table, so in your table. Letters, you'll see it on page three. Under yeah, officials are continuing discussions with colleagues in the Department of Health around the format of the amendment. But it does, it kind of outlines what it plans to cover. Yes. But we obviously don't have any details of what it, what it is yet. No, we don't have the actual text um, other than a commitment. We'll get it as soon as possible. Yeah, we have asked for it, and we've advised that the committee is unlikely to make a decision until it sees the text of the amendment. Okay, members, then content with clause eight as drafted, and we will move on to clause nine. So, clause nine provides for aggravation of the domestic abuse offence where a child is involved. Um, who is not the accused or the victim of the domestic abuse offence. So the key issues that were discussed with officials last week related to whether the clause, as currently worded, can apply in situations where the child does not directly witness the abuse or assuming it should apply in those circumstances and whether the wording should more clearly reflect the children are adversely affected beyond occasions where they only see, hear or are present. So uh, again, members, it's just to, to seek any views in respect of clause 9. Linda? There was a suggestion, um, it was by Women's Aid and actually I think maybe by a, a, few, a few of the other contributors around why a child wouldn't be considered a victim in their own right. And I think that's something that we, we potentially should consider. I think um, Women's Aid raised that point, um, or is that yeah. said, a call for children to be treated as victims in their own right and not as associated persons. 
um, in the written response. There are a few other organisations even, I think, under all the clauses that raised it as well. Um, Action for Children actually raised it as well. Yeah. Action for Children raised it. Um, I think that what the department has said um, in their written response is they gave careful consideration to the scope of the domestic abuse offence. Um, the Action for Children one probably gives the better. Um, the department carefully considered the scope of the domestic abuse offence in order to ensure the children could be captured within it in their own right, uh, where they are in a relationship or a family member except where parental responsibility applies in order to prevent criminalisation of this as a domestic abuse matter and that aggravation related to a child could be reflected while preventing criminalisation of parental responsibility. And they're looking at the amendment then to the health legislation provide protection across. Mm -hmm. um, just also the department has stated in their written response that no other jurisdiction locally provides for criminalisation in relation to parental responsibility. Uh, and while our provisions in relation to the offence in children go further than other jurisdictions already provide for. In England and Wales, the course of control offence is available for victims under the age of 16, except where parental responsibility applies, while in Scotland and the Republic of Ireland, the offence does not apply to family members. Chair, just Gordon, just on that, I think we're all aware how huge an issue domestic abuse is and how the PSNI are heavily involved in it. It's how, I suppose, uh, it just concerns me how that's measured in, in relation to um, the requirement is simply that the child sees here or is present. How, how is that going to be um, measured? Is, you know, is it a if the child is present and there's a family dispute, which sadly is a very regular occurrence, um, how, is that, how is that effectively going to be measured? Is it really like indirect abuse to the child rather than direct? I think that's where the department have said that even when the child isn't aware of it, it'll still it'll be an offence. Because that, that was one of the concerns, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's if the child sees it, hears it, um, it doesn't necessarily need to be aware that it's you know abusive in terms of its understanding of what's taking place. If I could come up, have you finished, Gordon? On that, yes. Yeah. yeah. Rachel had been just sorry, trying to get sorry. in. Go ahead. Uh, just just on that point that Gordon raises, because I think it is a valid one, and it's one that we tussled with mm. last week uh, with Veronica. The presence of a child issue is a big one because it could be the wide threat that's imposed on a loved one that the child would become involved, which would make that victim, domestic violence, do all sorts of things to comply. So, so the presence of a child being downstairs or upstairs can put so much more pressure and weight and malice to a threat. Uh, and I think that's why it's so important that something like this be covered. No, I appreciate it there, and sure, and it's necessary. But how it's going to be applied is, I suppose, the big challenge. If it's, as I say, a family dispute that sadly happens so often, and, and you know, how deep does the damage have to be before it becomes an offence? Um, I think last week the officials um, indicated that you could have a situation where the child is used to abuse another individual. Uh, clause 9.2b states the child saw or heard or was present um, and they indicated they could be in another room in the house, they could be in a bedroom while the abuse is taking place in the living room and potentially there is scope for that to be covered. And I think Rachel you asked them just to clarify if it is covered and the Scottish approach um, and the response we received this morning. Um, they said that the, in the, Scot the Scotland approach provides that the domestic abuse offence is so aggravated if a child sees, hears or is present during an incident of behaviour that A directs at B as part of the course of behaviour. It is considered that the offence we are putting through in relation to child aggravation is wider than the Scottish offence 
in that there's no requirement for a reasonable person to consider that the behaviour would adversely impact on a child or that the child has to live with a victim or offender. The requirement in the bill is simply that the child sees, hears or is present. And the Department is also of the view that the Scottish provisions do not extend to abuse that occurs outside the home, that is, where a child lives in another household from that in which violence occurs. Rather, it is about the extent to which evidence of the impact on the child is needed. So I think they're saying that it mirrors Scotland and then slightly wider than Scotland. Okay, thanks, Chair. Rachel? Yep, I suppose just picking up on that, um, the Scottish Legislation Clause 5 Subsection 5 uh, states that for it to be proved that the offence is so aggravated that there does not need to be evidence that a child has had ever, ha ever had any awareness of A's behaviour or understanding of the nature of A's behaviour or has been adversely affected by A's behaviour. So it is different. I appreciate that the Department have said that there's, it may cover that, but it's not specifically worded in our legislation that that is in there. So therefore, I see where Gordon's coming from in terms of perhaps enforcement of this and how evidence is gathered mm -hmm. on this. So because the Scottish legislation specifically says that there does not, it's an assumption that there has been an offend, a, a harm done. It doesn't state level. Um, in terms of the Scottish legislation, it says evidence for a single source. That's to reflect the Scottish um, the way that they actually get ev evidence on, on prosecutions. It needs to come from um, two sources or more. So this is to change that. But in terms of, of effective enforcement of this and gathering of evidence by, say, the police uh, or an unsuccessful um, application to public prosecution, do we not need to have something in our legislation that assumes that harm has been caused rather than it saying, seeing, hearing, or being present during? Because I see that as quite restrictive, even if it, it, is, it is within the Scottish legislation, but they also have five, sub, section five, subsection five, to say that there doesn't need to be an awareness of the behaviour. Um, I see that there could be issues down the line in terms of, well, the child was asleep. That gets you into very messy ethical and moral considerations of what you can and can't do if you're conscious, or it gets into very, very big mm -hmm. philosophical arguments about, <laughs> about the nature of consciousness and what you can and can't experience. It also gets into um, very messy details about the uh, trauma and ACEs, uh, which we all need to be aware of. So I think there needs to be a little bit more in there in nine that reflects the Scottish legislation in terms of the awareness and the assumption. Okay. Sure, just in relation yeah. to, to what Rachel's saying, I, I, I agree with her, I think she's right. And the department used the case, and I can't remember the name of the family, so apologies, but I remember listening to them on the radio at the time of the, the, the two young men whose mother and sister were killed. Heart. And Heart for many years they weren't aware of what was going on. Their father had never physically attacked their mother in any way. But he had done things like one of the children had a nut allergy and he would have done things like brought nuts, you know, took, taken nuts into the house and mightn't have even said anything, but it was an intimated, I will, I will make sure that the child um, is, is given nuts. And, you know, things, it was very below the radar that, you know, people, it'd be very difficult to express how that's abuse, but it was. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and those two guys only realised that, obviously, as they got older and they were grown men and realised what had went on and the home was not right and removed their mother and sister from the home and the father then murdered both of them. So once once he lost control, but he had never been physically abusive and, and I mean, I think he might have raised his voice and things like that, but it was more that very subtle, constant, their whole lives. And I think that what Rachel's talking about there could, could possibly be captured in, in what she's saying. So we may need to look at that. Okay. Um, so it's uh, how we can include in the legislation that the committee needs to consider the issue around the awareness of the abuse um, and how the Scottish legislation captures that and ours doesn't. And is there a potential amendment um, to try and strengthen the legislation in respect of that? Uh, on the earlier points that were being made, Linda, in terms of a child being specifically specified, can you just elaborate a little bit more? What, what was the, the issue there that you were wanting 
that right. women's aid had, you were you were citing what women's aid had referenced around what they wanted in clause nine. Right. So they were they were saying that the child should be recognised as a victim in their own right, as opposed to as opposed to just being you know somebody a, who yeah an aggravating factor of someone else being domestically uh, uh, abused. I think that's where the department are suggesting the amendment to mm -hmm. legislation. The health, uh, and I think if you see the wording to that, that then that, that obviously could, could address that. But obviously, we haven't seen it yet. Is that where in clause 11 they're yeah. saying that they're going to to look at this? Yeah, make it explicit where a child is ill treated. Okay, okay, so let's pick up on that. Clause 11. Just, Sorry, does, does, does that mean then if there's multiple children in a, in a home and each one's class is a victim, we're talking about each one being an individual separate offence? So if you have six children and a, and a wife, are we saying that that's, uh, and I, I probably agree mm -hmm. with you on this, but are we saying that that is actually seven offences uh, and each one has to be treated as an individual offence? Uh, and taken through in that manner is that is that what we're? I mean, if we if we do treat and, and that you would be right to do that, but if you treat each one as an individual victim, that's what that's the route that we'll be going down. Is that correct? My understanding is that they look at the abusive incident. So if it's mm -hmm. an abusive incident, that's that's one abusive incident. If it was, say there was three children in the house. The aggravating factor would be there'd be three children affected, which might be considered more aggravating. And, and that's if you go down the route of, of an aggregating factor. The, the six kids are an aggregating factor to the overall one case. But if you're treating every child as an individual victim, which they would be, then, then, then each child then and literally would, could have and should have legal representation in regards to that. I've literally seen a family where three children have each had their own individual legal representation for a particular case. I mean. It, it might work, be worth clarifying that, that. Yeah. yeah, I think that's where it goes back to the department are suggesting an amendment to the health legislation to yeah. provide the protection for the children and be very clear what that protection is available. I'm not saying I'm I'm then not, each child could. Yeah, and I'm not saying as well. I just, I'm just like, I'm just, just clarification on it, just so, so I understand how it would work in a practical term. Okay, so um, we're going to pick up on. on on that aspect of the child then around clause 11 but in, in terms of clause 9 are members content then that we're going to look at um, the awareness of the abusive behaviour for a child and whether or not the legislation needs to be strengthened to cover that issue um, and incorporate obviously the Scottish examples being highlighted as, as a potential form of wording for that so with the exception of that area, we're content with clause nine, and, and let's look at um, whether or not it needs to be added to to cover that issue. Okay. Clause ten. <coughs> Excuse me. Clause ten provides that the domestic abuse offence can be constituted by a course of behaviour engaged by an accused occurring wholly or partly outside the United Kingdom when the accused is habitually resident in Northern Ireland um, or is a United Kingdom national. And the main issue raised in relation to this clause was by the former Attorney General uh, John Larkin QC who questioned whether the clause was outside the Assembly's legislative competence, legal advice and the Minister's position on this was provided to the Committee uh, last week. So whether members have any further comment to make around that if we're now content based upon all of the responses that we've received to it. Okay. Clauses 11 and 17. Uh, this uh, provides that the domestic abuse offence would not apply where an individual has parental uh, responsibility for an individual under the age of 18 as it's considered that in these instances there are wider <coughs> excuse me there are wider child um, there are wider child protection provisions that apply clause 17 provides that an offense cannot be aggravated if the partner or connected person is under 18 
and the accused has parental responsibility for them, as again it is considered that there are other provisions that deal with and should be more appropriately used for direct abuse of a child or a young person by their parent or carer. The key issues raised in relation to these clauses in the evidence and discussed with officials last week relate to whether the existing suite of children's legislation does provide a direct equivalent to the provisions in this bill. And the Department has indicated that it is having discussions with the Department of Health around this uh, uh, possible amendment to child protection provisions, uh, which is currently contained in health legislation, uh, which subject to agreement could be brought forward into this bill. The amendment would make it explicit that where a child is ill-treated, that this uh, would also include non-physical abuse and would make clear that it would be an offence uh, whether the suffering or injury caused to a child was physical or psychological in nature, uh, for example, isolation, humiliation, um, or indeed bullying. Um, officials have agreed to provide further information um, as soon as uh, they have it. Um, okay, member. So it does cover the issues that we have been talking about around the need to strengthen provisions for child. Um, I would want to see, in terms of the amendment being brought forward, I'm content with what the Department have indicated as the best way to do that in terms of amending the, the health legislation, and I would want to see this as the vehicle to do that. But we don't have a proposed wording for members to consider at this stage. So, Clause 11, are members content that we would... Um, park that one until we get the precise wording so that it covers what we're we're trying to do. Good. Okay. Clause twelve um, provides that it is a defence to the domestic abuse offence for the accused to show that the course of behaviour was, in the particular circumstance, reasonable. Um, so, members, the key issues that have been raised in respect of this clause, um, supported by the uh, PPS, the Bar Council and the Attorney General, um, but has been opposed by many of the key stakeholders, include uh, the following. Could this defence provide a loophole for perpetrators to exploit by presenting evidence that the conduct was reasonable, resulting in vulnerable people being abused. If this defence is removed from the bill, would the balance of the legislation be out of kilter, given the wide personal connection and the wide scope of the new offence currently provided for in the other provisions? Uh, is the wording appropriate or is the wording too broad? Would it be helpful to include further detail on how this defence will operate and the situations envisaged in which it would be used in either the uh, EFM or the guidance? Members, Linda. I would like to see some detail in, in the guidance, but I accept the arguments directly from the legal profession for having it in there, and the fact that it is in, in other pieces of legislation. Um, totally understand the concerns, but I think that the concerns that are raised are potential to happen anyway, regardless of whether this is in the legislation or not. I do think that, that people and perpetrators will use any and all defence at their disposal, and that's their right to do so. Um, I think where there is most definitely abuse, then, as in any case, you're going to have to be able to prove that anyway. So I, th I think that it does, on the balance, probably need to be in there, and accept that, but I'm, I'm certainly open to listening to other views in relation to it. I'm, I'm not hard and fast on that, but at this minute in time, looking at everything and hearing everything that we have heard in relation to the legal profession, the department, and even the concerns that have been raised, I would be content that, that it should remain. But as I say, it's certainly open to listening to, to others' views. Yeah. Okay. Um, Paul? Yeah, I'd agree with Linda on this one. I think that we need to keep it in. I think it's, it's if we're using a reasonable test throughout the other clauses, then yeah. you should have that balance. And I think it's just, to be honest with you, common sense balance. I, I think that it 
it's tested on a couple of issues, the, the vulnerability of a person and then also the actions conducted by the said perpetrator and whether that's reasonable or not. Mm -hmm. so, so there may well be times when an action is deemed reasonable but it, it was excessive or, or, or you know, it wasn't appropriate, mm -hmm. something else could have been done. So I think that would play out in the court. Uh, but, you know, as you say, as you rightly say, uh, anybody is, is entitled to a defence and to, to uh, provide that defence in court. And I, I just think that to remove it, I think we'll do an injustice to the bill and also put us in shaky territory. I just think it's the balance that needs to be... The only something that I think is doesn't have to be said because it would be through the course of a court case that this yeah. would play out, but, but I think it's it's good to be in there. Um, and, I, and I understand the, the, the rationale for people not liking it, not wanting it. Uh, you know, we want to see, we want to see people convicted of this offence. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Uh, for people who uh, are treating people and, as victims and creating victims, we want to see perpetrators uh, for, you know, get this law and, and uh, be punished for it. But we also need to make sure that it's, it's a reasonable law. And this, I think this adds to that. Thank you. Rachel. Thanks, Chair. I'm certainly, um, I do have concerns over 12 and, and I, I expressed them last week in terms of how it could be used against a victim um, in certain situations, um, especially if there's alcohol or addiction or, or other. Um, issues there caused by abuse by the perpetrator. Um, so certainly um, still have, have those concerns. But in terms of the use of the reasonable defence, obviously in, in the research that was given and issued to us, there was a number of examples of other legislation where this is in. Serious Crime Act is also in Scotland, but again, um, different scope of the bill. Um, but it, do we have any I suppose just to try and put my mind at ease, we have any um, examples of where the reasonableness defence has been used inappropriately? Because um, I know it's not, in the, it's not in the research and I appreciate that that would be a massive amount of qualitative research for somebody to undertake, but it, if there has been significant concerns raised by organisations and respondents to this consultation on, on Clause 12, and I suppose it's just trying to allay those fears in a way that actually reasonableness defence is not used inappropriately? Yes. In, in relation to that, I'm not cutting across anybody here, am I? No. Just on, on the point that Rachel's making, and I, again, as I say, I fully understand those concerns, but in my own experience, particularly around tribunals even in relation to benefits and barristers and, and the legal profession chair those and they wouldn't accept that somebody having an alcohol or addiction problem would remove their ability to look after their own financial affairs so I actually that was one of the things whenever I was looking at that I was, I was concerned for all the same reasons because absolutely we, we all know that victims um, over, over a period of time if they're abused are going in most cases will become mentally unwell at the very least, but very often then will suffer from addiction problems. But in my experience, and I would like to think if they don't accept it in those tribunals, then when it would come to a court case, they wouldn't accept it either. Um, and, and that has been my experience in, in almost all okay, on almost all occasions where, where that has been an issue within a tribunal, and that's a much more informal setting than a, than a courtroom. So I, I would... I suppose that gave me some reassurance, and obviously that's not research, research, and it is anecdotal. But I've been doing them for quite some time, and I've done hundreds, if not thousands of them, and that's been my experience to date. You know, with many different chairpersons of panels, um, of all uh, mixed, very diverse panels. You know, been men, been women, been older, been younger. So I, I. Based on that, that's kind of what gave me some confidence in relation to having this in the in the legislation. And and likewise, that was my approach to it. You know that the reassurance is given that it 
both it, it's not been the practice uh, as you've outlined and also the comments that officials have made the tests that need to be applied as to whether or not that is reasonable and ultimately it would be for a judge and you know to, uh, to determine is that reasonable it's just not enough for the perpetrator to say it was reasonable in my mind mm-hmm. it's not up to the perpetrator to determine whether it was reasonable or not and i think there's good safeguards there in the legislation um, that would ensure that this isn't the loophole or the the, the get out of jail free card, so to speak, that I think people are concerned that it may well be, um, notwithstanding their concerns, because you know, this is a huge problem in terms of um, the kind of abuse that we're talking about and the frustration about lack of prosecutions and successful prosecutions. So I understand all of that, um, but I also understand the arguments that have been made as to why this is necessary, and I would be concerned that it's removal would have a very significant impact on what then should be covered in the actual bill, which I think is what the department has also indicated, that it would it would significantly change the way in which you would need to approach this bill if you didn't have this. Sinead Bradley. Chair, thank you, Chair, and apologies, I had audio issues there, but I have to say I've been very much in line with a lot of what's been said, but certainly I'm glad to be able to come in on this Clause 12, because it is one that gives me concern um, and and I do accept it has to be there for all the reasons we've said before but I suppose the bit that still jars a little bit with me is that if the test has been met that it is considered domestic abuse or abusive behaviour then to move on under the grounds of reasonableness to say that there is a type of or a situation where domestic abuse, which has been tested, is okay. And that, that, that I just really struggle with that. Um, and I know that there, you know, is it a case of then that the determination is that because of the situation and the reasonable test that it's not domestic abuse? Is that what the determination would reach? It's just the order and the sequencing of that testing, I suppose, still isn't clear in my mind. Okay, thank you, thank you Sinead. Um, and those are some of the issues that we have covered with the department as well. Um, I'm sure, Christine, if you want to... Yes, just looking at the written response from the department, um, they set out, uh, to make use of the defence, enough evidence must be provided by the defence to satisfy the judge that the issue of reasonableness should be left before the tribunal of fact, i.e. either the judge or the jury, depending on the court. Um, so, in other words, the, the person will be, have been charged with the offence and then they have to bring forward um, enough evidence and the judge has to be satisfied that there is enough evidence for it to be left. It is not enough simply to claim the defence and that the behaviour was reasonable. If the defence is left to the judge or jury to consider, it would be for the prosecution to prove beyond reasonable doubt that the course of behaviour was not reasonable in the particular circumstances. It is an objective test that is applied. That is, would a reasonable person in possession of the same information consider the behaviour reasonable in the particular, particular circumstances of the case? The application of the defence will need to take into account the particular circumstances of the case, including the position of the victim. There is an evidential burden of proof on the defence that on the balance of probabilities the actions were reasonable in the particular circumstances. If the defendant fails to discharge this evidential burden, they will not be able to rely on that defence. And they also pointed out, in addition, evidence of the reasonableness will have to be provided on two or more occasions. It cannot be a one-off incident. And it will be for the judge to decide if there is sufficient evidence. Um, just reading on, um, yeah, if the judge is satisfied then that there is sufficient evidence, it is then for the public prosecution service to disprove the defence. Uh, a person who used the defence and stated that they were acting in the other person's best interests, but were a reasonable person with access to the same information, would not find that behaviour to be reasonable, is very likely to have their defence rebutted by the prosecution. Okay, Sinead. Um. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Chair. And, and it was even on, on after going over that, um, that 
that's still there. I suppose it is. It's like Linda said, it is about how this is used in practice um, will be the real proof of it. And I, I do get it, you know, I do get it. And, and we've had conversations in the past about parenting and safeguarding and all of those things that are in there and the situation can. So, so we do get it, but I, I just, yeah, I, I have those reservations to be fair. Okay, members, so not, notwithstanding the reservations I think members have expressed, I'm not hearing any alternative in terms of a legislative text that we could be considering either. Um, so on that basis, I'm, I'm going to, to take it forward that at this stage we're content with clause 12 um, and, and the comments that have been made will be obviously part of the report and we'll, we'll put that forward at the, the formal consideration stage as it's currently drafted. Okay, clause 13 provides that where a charge is brought for the domestic abuse offence but a court is not satisfied that this has been committed, it is possible to convict the accused of a specified alternative offence. Key issues that we discussed with officials last week was the, the need for this clause with the department outlining that it was envisaged that an alternative offence would only be provided where it's not possible to evidence a personal connection between two individuals, which is a requirement for the domestic abuse offence, but it is considered the behaviour would amount to harassment or stalking in terms of the new offence in due course. These are both uh, course of behaviour offences, that is two or more incidents um, being needed. Members, was there any views around clause 13? Paul, had you raised these issues before? Yeah. I'll let anybody else come in because I'm I've lost my train of thought here just at the minute. You're okay. I think the, moment. this was picked up. Um, I remember when you raised it just at the meeting. They came back with the response on it. Christine, do you want to just cover it? Um, yeah. In terms Thank of the department's position. Oh yes, sorry. This is I, I'll come in now if if, if while uh, the clerk's looking for it. But it's it was with regards to the concern that they would the judge would go plump for a lesser charge, yeah. a lesser charge for a safe conviction rather than trying to push out for domestic violence charge. Yep, uh, I remember raising that with Veronica last week. Um, I think her answer at the time assuaged my concerns. Yep. Yeah, I think what the department um, highlighted in relation to this is it is envisaged that an alternative offence would only be provided where it is not possible to evidence a personal connection between two individuals, which is required for the domestic abuse offence, and therefore um, the domestic abuse offence couldn't be proved. Um, but it is considered that the behaviour would amount to harassment or stalking in terms of the new stalking offence in due course. These are both course of behaviour offences, that is two or more incidents, um, and it would be for the court to determine then on conviction, but they seem to um, indicate that it would only be used where they couldn't prove the personal connection. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so members were, sorry, Rachel. Just, just to, sorry, I'm also losing my train of thought here on this one, but just, the domestic abuse offence could only be charged. You could only be charged with domestic abuse offence if you met a certain criteria. Mm -hmm. One of those criteria would mean that you would be personally connected, yeah. as outlined within the legislation. So, how does thirteen exist if, where it's not possible to evidence a personal connection between two individuals? Surely, then it would never. They would never be charged with a domestic abuse offence because they haven't met the full criteria. I'm assuming it's I'm because you can. They can be charged. They can challenge the personal connection. A challenge can be put in. Um, and I'm assuming on that basis, but we can check with the department that if a challenge was put in, but the public prosecution service felt that they could prove the personal connection, they would carry on with that. Yeah. Um, but there would be the chance that when it got to court, the personal connection wasn't found, and there, therefore they would revert to the other offence. But we can clarify that. I'm assuming that's what that's why it's there. It's just a, a kind of safety. Because you yeah. can put in a challenge to the personal connection. Can I add to that? Yes, um, that's what was going through my mind last week when that was discussed and it, it really highlighted the importance of how much of this hinges 
on that definition of connection. And yeah, so what was so my in my mind I was run through so somebody could claim to have been in a relationship with somebody else and that other person then denying that relationship ever existed. So I think there are a lot an awful lot hinges back to that earlier conversation piece about the definition of connection. Linda? Um just on, on, on the back of, again, Rachel's point and what Paul has said in terms of it, you know, the, the department's response addressing his concerns, you know, there's nothing there that clearly says that, even though they're saying that would be their understanding. Now, again, if it was in the guidance, then that would be, you know, that would give you some more reassurance around that that danger of, of the of the lesser charge being used so, and I, I can understand more victims because very often this happens where victims feel that perpetrator of lots of different types of crimes have been you know it's easier to get them on a lesser charge and so the court pumps for the the lesser charge because let's just get them let's just get this over and done with but victims are not always satisfied with that so probably would like some more reassurance around that one as well. And, and I also see it from the other side as in it's a safety net not to let somebody walk away free as well. So um, again, I have concerns, but I, I would have concerns with, with removing it also. I'm just wondering if you remove it, what would that, what would be the implications be, yeah. for the likes of the PPS taking mm -hmm. forward a case? You know, um, I think that's, that's why probably I'm where we need some yeah. information on that. Right. It, it just it's it's getting back to that. If they if you can't if it's not feasible to progress the charge of domestic abuse without proving the personal connection, then why would that why would why would there be a need for thirteen? There obviously is a need for thirteen mm -hmm. in in some way, but for me there's not enough detail on why that is and how that would be implemented. I would love to have a scenario or an example of this needed, you know, um, played out. And also just in, in terms of our um, harassment orders um, and our harassment laws, you know, they've been widely criticised as not been good enough. So it's, yes, if there's a safety net, is, it, is that strong enough? You know, what's the fallback position? And is that good enough? Yeah, if I can back in again, sorry for the indulgence, but, but I suppose to me it all is nailed on the definition of, of in the first clause with regards to how people are connected. And, and reading there, and I know you've, I'm going to overrule ground when I wasn't here, but A and B are personally connected to each other at the time. Uh, so what does that actually mean? And it strikes me also that this is where the stocking piece really needs to come uh, because there will be an occasion where somebody thinks they are connected and the other one doesn't. And that strikes me as being right in the heart of this with regards to the stocking piece. And, and that's why I think if there was, and again, we'll be talking about what's not in the bill next week, I think, but I'm going to push it here. The, the, a clause on stocking might well help to strengthen that up, iron that up, out, and, and also then maybe help the definition of one. Close one. Okay. Christine. Sure. Sorry. Christine's just a bit more information I think could be helpful. And then I'll bring you in, Sinead. Um, just members, in the written correspondence from the department, <coughs> sorry, on the 18th of May, they covered um, this issue um, of why the alternative available for conviction is needed and why a person would not meet the threshold for the domestic abuse offence. Um, and what they've said is, in some domestic abuse offence cases, the court may not be satisfied that the accused committed the offence. This might be because the personal connection could not be proved. The bill provides that the person can be convicted of a specified alternative offence if there's enough evidence to prove that offence, and it's intended to make the provisions as robust as possible. The alternative offences are the offence of harassment and putting people in fear of violence, and the stalking offences would also be included in due course. Individuals could potentially be charged with both the domestic abuse offence and an alternative offence or offences from the outset if considered appropriate and dependent on the particular circumstances of the case. 
Um, it was also asked whether the alternative available for conviction provision could be used by barristers to try and get the accused a lesser charge of harassment. It is considered that if the court is satisfied that the accused committed the domestic abuse offence, that they will be charged and convicted of this. So it's quite Linda, or, sorry, let me bring in Sinead and then I'll, I'll come to you, Linda. Thank you, Chair. So my understanding was um, from the feedback we had, so this it meant that if that personal connection wasn't established, that it wasn't thrown out, that there was still a charge that could be brought forward. And I, I was satisfied in hearing the explanation given, but I'm not sure now on reflection that the actual wording of the clause does reflect the explanation. Um, I'm not sure if it's as well defined as the supplementary evidence or information that came following it. Okay. My point is exactly, Shani, it's, it's, it's what I've already said, that I'm concerned about the wording of the clause, not the actual fact that it's that it's there, because for, for the point that Sinead made where, where you have a potential of somebody denying a relationship that at least you have, particularly whenever we have the stalking legislation, you will have that, that safety net. But I think it is important to have it there, but it's the wording of it that's probably a bit concerning. Yeah. I think it's needed for the catch all, but I, I just don't want then a race to the bottom with regards to charging. Uh, so there is that two-edged sword. I think I think we do need more querying on it. I think. It, yeah. Okay. And of course, there's nothing to stop someone being charged with another offence as soon as they walk out of the court. They're charged at any time for any offence. Mm -hmm. At least deem it to be. You know, you could walk out of a court having having uh, one a, a one against the charge of domestic violence, and as soon as you walk out of the court, you could be arrested for harassment. Nothing to stop that happening. Okay, let, let, let's ask the department to give us much more detail as to why this is necessary, because uh, I can see the arguments uh, uh, both ways around all of this, um, and I think the point is made that um, the stalking aspect of legislation, the harassment, where you don't have a personal connection, would have been covered if that legislation was being taken forward. But um, sure, can we also ask them? Could the warden be? Have they any ideas on how the wording could be changed to reflect what we're saying and what they actually said themselves around what what the purpose of it is? Yeah, I think we 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 we'll need to bottom out what we will not just the department what they're trying to do, but we would then need to know ourselves what is it that we want it to do? Because um, I'm not I'm not even clear exactly what we would want to do if we don't go with clause thirteen as currently drafted, because. I think people could be sweet. Uh, you know, my own view here is that um, could people not get prosecuted if we didn't have this? Because the, the test could be too high that the PPS fail. Do you know what? We're not sure that we can prove the personal connection here. Um, therefore, we're not going to proceed with the case. And that may be an implication if you remove clause 13. But against that is a fear that you take forward the prosecution and during the court case, they decide, you know what? It's proven challenging to get a conviction on these other thresholds. Let's go for clause 13, um, because that's that's a, a win for us. Um, so I can see the arguments around this and what the problem is, but um, I think if we can get the department to give us more justification for why this is needed, to try and reassure members that, that those issues can be teased out properly. Um, Paul's point is right in, in relation to if, if somebody walks out of the court and they haven't been found guilty of the, the domestic abuse charge, they can be re-arrested under a, a different charge. However, that's then going back to the beginning again, which we all know that the challenges we have around getting victims to court in the first place, having, having successful outcomes. So for that reason, I'm probably a wee bit nervous about removing it because it doesn't potentially then maybe give you the option in the middle of the court proceedings to say, right, we're really going to have difficulties here get, making the connection, so let's go for the mm -hmm. uh, surcharge. So I actually can see why, why it would be there. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm, I'm back to Sinead's point on, is, is the warden right? 
I think I, I actually would be solid now in my own thinking that it should be there. Mm -hmm. But but is the wording right? Are you content, Christine, you've enough that we need the clarity on? Yeah, we'll ask for clarity and we'll ask about whether the wording yeah. um, be enhanced to reflect the meaning. Okay. Okay, members then will we'll proceed on that basis that we'll get some more detail on it. I think we've teased out the dilemma quite well, um, but a little bit more information I think will be helpful just to, to come to a conclusion on it. Um, okay, clause 14 uh, provides the uh, penalties for the offence. Um, the penalty for the offence being 12 months or a fine or both on summary conviction and 14 years or a fine or both on conviction on indictment and again members the main issue raised in the evidence uh, <coughs> related to the lack of court mandated programs for perpetrators of domestic abuse the need to implement child contact orders the need for sentencing guidelines the approach to young persons charged with the offence and the potential use of restorative uh, justice so all of those points were related to but not directly associated with the text of the legislation. Is, is there any views members want to express around clause 14? No, we're... I, I, I'd be keen to know if, if, if all of that um, rehabilitation, all the stuff that you've raised with regards to concerns, are usually in the face of a bill, whether that's just something that comes along with a sentence. I know in the discussions that we had with Veronica, they talked about you know the, the guidance that will all be associated with with the bill, and we touched on I think this clause as part of that as well. But um, members content then with clause fourteen as drafted? Yes. Okay. Right, yeah. um, clause fifteen provides for any offence other than the domestic abuse offence. Uh, to be aggravated by reason of involving domestic abuse. Where the aggravation is proved, the court must state on conviction that the offence is aggravated and take the aggravation into account when determining sentence. State how the aggravation has affected the sentence and record the conviction in a manner which shows that the offence was aggravated by reason of involving domestic abuse. The main points made in the evidence related to how repeat offences involving several different women would be handled and the need to record this aggravator throughout the whole process from initial police report to a resolution in court. The Bar um, of Northern Ireland was of the view that the requirement to, ind uh, to indicate precisely how the, offense, uh, how the offence affected the sentence would not be necessary. Um, so, members, it's whether you have any views around Clause 15. Members are content with clause 15 then. Um, Sinead, are you wanting to come in or is that from a previous? Hands up. <laughs> Sorry, that's okay. Um, okay, so we're content with clause 15 as drafted. Um, clause 16 um, sets out the conditions for the aggravation to apply, similar to those that apply to the domestic abuse offence. Again, members of the Bar of Northern Ireland highlighted that um, 16.3 gives a very broad scope to this clause. Other issues raised were the same as those for clauses 1 and 2. So, again, members, if there's any issues members wish to raise in respect of clause 16, otherwise we're content with the Department's response and justification for it. Yeah. Okay, content. Okay, um, we've covered clauses 17, 18, 19, 20 when we discussed clauses 11, 5, 6 and 7. Um, 17 we're coming back to with 11 um, because it was related to the child, um, yeah, the amendment. Okay, so clause 21 um, prohibits those accused of a summary offence of domestic abuse before a magistrate's court from the right uh, to elect for trial by jury at Crown Court. The Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission commented that the provision should only be utilised in exceptional circumstances. Um, so again, members, it's your views if you wish to comment around Clause 21. 
Okay, members content then with clause 21 as drafted. Clause 22 um, enables complainants of the domestic abuse offence and aggravated offences to automatically be eligible for consideration of special measures when giving evidence. Um, the key issues raised related to the provision of special measures for victims and survivors of domestic abuse in family and civil courts. The Department was seeking the views of the Lord Chief Justice on, amendment, uh, on an amendment to require court rules to be made. The court rules would enable the court hearing uh, family proceedings to make a special measures direction in relation to a party or witness who is a victim of domestic abuse and require a court to assume their uh, vulnerability so that the court will be required to consider whether it's necessary to make a direction and to enable the court hearing civil proceedings to make uh, a special measures direction in relation to a witness who is a victim of certain offences. Uh, where the court is satisfied that their vulnerability is likely to diminish the quality of their evidence or otherwise affect their participations in proceedings. Officials agreed to provide further information on the views of the uh, Lord Chief Justice and the wording of the proposed amendment, and this was requested uh, for today's uh, meeting, um, which we have in the, in the tabled letter from this morning. Um, and that is the amendment I think you had earlier Rachel w w yes I think well it says it was going to be before clause 26 insert yes okay so I'm not too sure if it's the same do you have that you? we have the I don't actually have that tech, or it's maybe attached to this is it Okay, members. Um, so, in clause 22, around the special measures, um, I'm content with the response that we have got, but I appreciate we've literally just been given an amendment. So, I'm happy that we would um, look at it next week, yeah. just to give members time to consider that amendment as has been provided. Can Linda. Just yeah. a point. Uh, it's, it's not in relation to the actual clause, but um, there was a recommendation by Women's Aid around um, having the automatic entitlement in the family courts where there's evidence of domestic abuse. And this would be in line with some of the other conversations that we've had around where there is a case of domestic abuse and there's cases going on in the family courts that we should be trying to align the two. Um, and I think that also was a recommendation in the Gillen review. Mm. So could we just write to the department and ask them, is it their intention to do that? Um, I'm just wondering whether the letter that you received this morning yeah, indicated they also... Um, Does it address that? Pardon? Does it address that? Well, well they're, they're saying the up. department's advised of another proposed amendment in relation to family proceedings. Um, I would amend Article 12A of the Children Northern Ireland Order 1995 in consequence of the new domestic abuse offence and the child aggravator. Uh, it has to be agreed with the Department of Finance because private law sits with them. Um, I'm just looking to see. Is that on our table pack or is that my email that we got this morning? The tabled. Yeah, sorry. The department intends to bring forward an amendment uh, so that a court considering an application for a contact or residence order will be specifically required to have regard to the conviction of the party applying for the order for the new domestic abuse offence. Does that cover what you're asking? No, I don't think it does. I don't think it doesn't. I know because we're talking about the special measures here that are specifically outlined in, in clause okay, 22 in being, being put in place for the family courts. So. So they, they think they add a I mean that is the text of the I do think that is good, but it's not it's not addressing the issue that I'm talking about here. Chair, my brief reading of that amendment this morning was it's a, it's an amendment to the child order or the children order of nineteen ninety five with regard to the residence and contact orders and it's a technical amendment yeah. to um, and just very briefly reading um the table pack was that so 
someone who has a within within the Ch children order 1995 if it's brought in front of the court if there's a non molestation order in place mm -hmm. then someone could you know there, there could be a there could be an approach taken about the harm caused or threat of harm to a child but not if somebody has been convicted of the domestic abuse offence because it's a new offence so that would, for, in my reading of it, and I could be completely wrong, but that is a technical amendment to include mm -hmm. the domestic abuse offence when it's created, yeah. rather than changing any form of structure or process within the family courts with regard to the treatment of victims of domestic abuse and their perpetrators, which I think is what Linda is trying to bring up, and I would certainly agree with her on the need to sort of streamline and, and dovetail with the processes that go on within the family courts and the criminal courts, because um, you don't want to have a situation where you've got special measures in place um, for victims in the criminal courts, but then in the family courts, it's exactly the same situation. And where it's almost, in some senses, more important because that's where the perpetrators potentially going to get access to your children. And, you know, if somebody's found guilty and goes to jail, that's one thing. For me personally, the protection of my child would always be the priority over whether someone goes to jail for attacking me. So. In, in some cases, it's actually more important within the family courts. Yeah. Okay, members. Um, it's whether, for, from memory, and again, I'm, I'm only thinking times that we've discussed this, our, our ability to legislate for how the courts operate. I, I'm not think actually it, asking asking yeah. for that. To be fair, I just want us to write to the department and ask: Is is it their intention to to address that? Yeah. Because I would like something in writing from them to say it is. Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm content that if they come back and say that they are intent to address it, I, because I, I agree with you, I don't think that we potentially that we can put that in this piece of legislation. But I certainly would like something in writing from the department around their intentions. And as I say, it was in the Gillen recommendations yes. as well. So. Yeah. Okay, I'm ha happy to do that. Thank you. And I agree to you're right. Just from scanning over that letter, I think that is a technical amendment it relates to clause 26. So. Yeah, we still need the wording of the other. So the, just to confirm, sorry, Chair, um, that the the amendments that. Um, it's in the table pack today that they're discussing that the intention is to take forward an amendment to the bill to provide for court hearing civil proceedings of discretion of power. We still don't have the detail on that. But we will be getting it. We've asked the department to provide us with the wording for any draft amendments as soon as possible. Okay. Yeah. okay. So we're going to come back to clause 22. Um, in terms of the special measures aspect of it, just so that I keep a track of exactly where we are. Clause 23. I'm content. What I'm just checking is for in this tabled information to see what is interfacing across the rest of these clauses because um, this new amendment one, I'm just not sure if it has any bearing on clause 23. <coughs> no. Clause 23 um, adds the domestic abuse offence to the list of offences which prohibits the accused from cross examining a partner connected person in person. Um, and the prohibition applies only to hearings where a partner or connected person is to give evidence. Okay. There's been no issues then raised in the evidence around that clause. So members content with clause 23. Yeah. Clause 24 is a technical amendment relating to changes to the criminal evidence order in 1999, providing that an offence involving domestic abuse means, most, means both the domestic abuse offence and offences aggravated by reason of involving domestic abuse. Um, there's been no issues raised in evidence in respect of this. Members content with clause 24? Yes. Uh, 
Um, Clause 25 stipulates that the Department of Justice may issue and may revise guidance in relation to the domestic abuse offence <coughs> or any other matter as to criminal law and procedure relating to domestic abuse. The guidance must be published and a person exercising public functions whom the guidance relates to must have uh, regard to it. Um, and the main issue that we discussed with officials was whether the wording should be changed from may to will or must and whether a requirement for a review of the guidance after a specified period of time should be included in the legislation. So if other members have any more views, did the department cover that point in this tabled pack? Kristen, do you know? Um, I think in the oral evidence last week, they covered um, the point about the wording may issue guidance. Mm -hmm. um, and they've said it's very much our intention that there will be guidance published and publicly available, and possibly the phrasing is not of much comfort, but that is fairly standard terminology. From a departmental perspective, it would never be our intention to have guidance, to not have guidance available and published, but the wording is may. Yeah, Chair, I'll, I'll, bring, I'll bring Linda in, and then I'll, I'll bring you in, Paul. I think, in fairness, I mean, I, I do believe that the department are going <laughs> to issue the guidance, but I don't understand then why it says may and not will. And yes, I know that it is terminology, but there's a reason that that's the terminology of the Jews, because there are departments that don't intend create many guidance. And we had the same issue as this around other stuff in, in recent times with um, legislation and why you would put in may and and not put in well if you fully intend to do it. I don't see any reason for it. I do understand the reason for not putting will revise the guidance because if the guidance is good and you don't and people are not raising the issue that the guidance needs revised, not having will in for revising the guidance doesn't prevent people from at a later stage saying we think the guidance needs revised. But I don't understand why you wouldn't have it in there in the first instance to say we will provide guidance when you fully intend to provide guidance. And in fairness, I do think they do fully intend because they've said they will share that guidance with us as soon as they have it. But I think it's just um, it's a bit silly not to not to just change it to will. But as I say, the reason is absolutely because that's what departments use so that they don't have to provide guidance. Rachel, I completely agree with Linda there. I think if they, I get it that there might be a. Um, a wording issue and maybe a standardisation of, of how, how departments put um, get in, you know, regarding guidance into, into legislation, but um, given that they are going to provide guidance and they have to provide guidance on this, and it's been throughout every single submission to this committee on this consultation about the importance of guidance, mm -hmm. resourcing and all the rest of it, I think it, there shouldn't be an issue, um, and I'd be surprised if there was a barrier put up to say no it has to say may or will i think the stronger the case for having guidance in place at all times the better um just given its importance um and fight you know bickering over wording i don't think <laughs> it's going to be helpful but i would certainly be in support of it changing to must and will or one of the two okay I agree 100% with both commentators on that point. I don't understand why there's no reasonable excuse why you would add the word may there instead of will. I can take Linda's point about uh, 25.3, the department may revise any guidance issued under this section. Yep, I'm quite fine with that. But that 25.1 should read, the Department of Justice will issue guidance. Look, this is new legislation that's groundbreaking. We're, we're entering into the court to coercive control for the first time. We need guidance on this. It's a must. Okay. And and if this was to go to court on something, the barrister will will, will, will stipulate the word may, and and that would be it. So may that three letter word is very very important. Change to a four letter word. She need. It's a will from me, chair. <laughs> <laughs> okay, members. Well then. Um, I'm happy that we, we try to get it changed. Set, notwithstanding this issue, set that aside. If I was a minister, I would rather it was May. But I'm not. <laughs> because if you applied this to other bills, 
the assembly could legislate and make huge amendments to a minister's piece of legislation and if they then say the minister doesn't like it the assembly passes it then the minister's left that it must issue guidance in line with legislation that they didn't like i could see why that could be difficult but on this issue i don't see why it would present any difficulty um chair on that point we're not saying that the minister must present guidance that we like um, i'm saying that they must she must do guidance well it's so. well it's, it's not it's, it's, it's guidance that reflects the legislation that's why ministers probably prefer may so to run that argument right through so if there's an amendment that some of us as individuals or even this committee puts in place and is passed in the assembly is any minister going to resist that so yeah that would be a good test set a precedent for our executive colleagues that they mightn't like <laughs> okay so are members content then we will um want to see a change in the draft legislative text that the word may is removed and replaced with uh, either will or must whichever gives the legal um copper fastening to to what we're trying to put it into effect uh, the rest of the wording members are content with then, subject to seeking that change. Okay. Clause 26 inserts new provisions into the Family Law Order 1993 to protect victims of abuse from being cross examined by perpetrators in person in family uh, proceedings. So, the key issue raised in relation to this clause included extending the prohibition to any family proceedings in which allegations of domestic abuse are being determined and a number of issues highlighted by the Bar of Northern Ireland. The Department had indicated that the, clause, uh, provides, that the clause provides for the automatic prohibition to apply where there is other evidence of domestic abuse to be specified in regulations made by the Department. The Department intends to consult on the types of evidence of domestic abuse that should trigger the automatic prohibition uh, before making any regulations. Um, let me just go back to... Yes, Linda. Yeah, similar point to Buzz 22, just to, to ask the department, do they intend to, to adopt that recommendation around the, um, whether they're considering adopting the Women's Aid recommendation to an automatic prohibition of, of cross-examination in any family proceedings where there's allegations of domestic abuse or where the perpetrator has admitted. Okay, I'm just I'm looking to Christine because I know it references clause 26 in this letter that came in just before the committee meeting. Yeah, that was the one we'd highlighted earlier. They proposed to make a minor amendment to clause 26, but that doesn't address. Uh, it doesn't address my yet. question. And, and again, these are just questions to the department about how do they attend, intend to address those. It's, it's they're both about the family courts, so. Okay. Members, I haven't had time to look at this amendment, so I can't even give my own opinion on it. Um, it wouldn't be fair to ask the committee to give a view on it at this stage either, even if it is as presented technical in nature. You can come back to clause 26. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll deal with clause 26 next week. Um, clause 27 makes provision in relation to the commencement of the provisions, the majority of which will be by way of a commencement order. Um, no issues were raised in the evidence in respect of clause 27. Members content. Um, clause 28 provides for the short title of the bill. And no issues were raised um, during the evidence in respect of that. Are members content then with clause 28? Content. Okay. Um, Thank you for your patience and, and working through that. Sorry, I was just jumping about there at the end a little on some of that information that came in just before the meeting. Um, in respect to proposed amendments around clauses 9 and potentially 25, um, the committee obviously can w w ask the department to bring something forward, um, or indeed we can ask Stephanie to look at this for us. 
Or I can do both. Well, well let, let's ask the department uh, on this as well, but it might be helpful if we just have a, a brief chat with Stephanie then around this. Um, and I think we're going to go into closed session for that. Okay, so we'll go, we'll go into closed session and we'll bring Stephanie in for a chat. Okay, members, um, item number five on the agenda then is the Draft Justice Act 2016 Order 2020, pages 308 to 316. The Department proposes to make a stat rule under section 147 of the Justice Act 2016 to add universal credit to the list of benefits from which payments can be taken in line with Part 1 of the Act. Um, part 1 of the Act introduced a system of collection and enforcement of unpaid fines and other financial penalties which aimed to reduce levels of unpaid debt and prison committals for low-level offending. Among other measures, this includes powers to make deductions from a specified list of income-based benefits and attachment of earnings orders. Universal credit had not been introduced by the time the Act was passed in 2016. The power to add to the list of benefits from which payments could be taken was therefore included to allow universal credit to be added at the appropriate time. And the Department has confirmed that the rule is not a policy change, but adds a benefit which will eventually replace those that are already listed in the Act. Consultation took place during the development and passage of the Bill. The Department has advised that no external consultation was necessary in respect of this rule. Uh, the statutory rule will be subject to draft affirmative procedure uh, and will come into operation as soon as possible. Members content to note the stat rule. I just have a question in terms of um, the level of this. There, there's discussion of it, about minimising hardship you know, through legislative safeguards, limiting the maximum amount that can be taken from a person's benefits or earning, earnings um, with regard to hardship. And we all know that universal credit does cause hardship um, for the majority of people that I deal with anyway. Um, so I would, just, I would be interested to know what the legislative safeguards are in place just with regard to this. Um, you know, how is hardship evidenced? You know, if somebody cannot afford to have a certain amount of money taken out of their payment per, per month, um, and what, what happens if somebody who is on universal credit is, say, already paying back a, an advanced payment or a loan um, on, their, on their payment? You know, and would, sort of how would this be communicated to applicants and the advice sector, especially if there is no external consultation being done? Okay, well, happy to ask. From memory, I think it was on the committee when we passed this legislation and all of those type of issues we considered um, at the time, which is why there hasn't been any need for, according to the department, to do any more consultation on it. Um, but I'm happy to, that we, we get information around that. Okay. Um, item 6. PSNI retention and disposal schedule, pages 318 to 400. The place retention disposal schedule is required to be laid before the Assembly under Section 82 of Public Records Act 1923 and in accordance with the rules of the Disposal of Documents Order 1925 by the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland. The retention and disposal schedule is subject to negative resolution procedure. The Police Service Retention and Disposal Schedule identifies records and inf information which will be managed, stored, retained, destroyed or transferred if appropriate for permanent uh, preservation to the Public Record Office. The schedule specifies the minimum requirements for the retention and disposal of records and information. Are members content with the Retention Disposal Schedule? Content? As it is insured with the Policing Board? I don't know is the answer. Can, can we ask the department? Um, okay, we'll ask the department. Item seven: use of live link technology for police detention and interviews. Results of targeted consultation and proposed way forward. Four hundred two to four six two of the meeting pack. At our meeting on the thirtieth of June, the committee considered information from the department on the outcome of the consultation on the use of live link technology for reviews of police detention, 
extension of pace detention by a superintendent, extension of pace detention by the court, and interviews of a detained person and the department's intention to proceed with drafting legislation to implement all the proposals. The committee agreed to write to the department to raise some concerns regarding its intention to proceed in relation to the use of LiveLinks technology for police interviews, given that nearly half of respondents to the consultation objected to its use and to request information on whether equality screening had taken place on the proposals. The Department has provided a summary of responses it received in relation to interviews via live links and has indicated that the main concerns related to the detainee's ability to understand proceedings and requests for additional safeguards for young and vulnerable. The Department has advised that revisions to the statutory pace codes of practice will incorporate multiple safeguards to address the concerns raised and there will be a separate consultation on these. It is also proposed that provisions for live links in the Justice Miscellaneous Provisions Bill will be commenced by order of the Department, which will ensure the necessary code amendments have been completed and are commenced at the same time as the legislative provisions. The Department has also advised that it completed an initial screening exercise, which resulted in the decision to screen out a full equality impact assessment. However, during the consultation period, officials revisited the exercise and received feedback from the Equality Commission, which resulted in the assessment being amended to screened out with mitigating actions. The mitigating actions have been included in the proposals and applied to the number of groups that will be minimally impacted. So, members, in light of the additional information, it's to indicate that you are content with the intention of the Department to include provisions for all live link proposals in the miscellaneous provisions bill. Sorry, Linda. The, the mitigating actions, I'm, I'm just wondering what the, the views of the organisations that raised the concerns in the first place, particularly around those vulnerable groups, um, are of the mitigating actions and whether they actually address their concerns. And, and I would like to see something from those in relation to that aspect of it, whether those organisations that raise the concerns are content that the mitigating actions address their concerns. Okay. Um, rather address their concerns. Can we ask the department if they've got the feedback from those groups in respect of that? You can ask. I'm not and clear. if they haven't Pardon? asked for it, then yeah, they have I'm not sure like whether they're, they're intending to consult on the draft codes. I see that. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's where they think they're going to. And if that's what they come back with, that's okay. But I, I just would like to establish that because you know just as the chair was reading that out I kind of thought that myself I wonder is that mm -hmm. where the intention is I but I, I'll just like something back from them on that yeah, I suspect it is I suspect they'll put out the draft codes with the mm -hmm. changes and for consultation but we can confirm that okay um, item 8 legally aid update and progress to implement um, audit office and PAC recommendations the Department has provided an update on work that has been undertaken by the Legal Services Agency to address the Audit Office and Public Accounts Committee recommendations and the qualifications to the agency annual accounts. The Department has indicated work is ongoing to review business processes and operational guidance and instructions. As part of this work, the Business Consultancy Service within the Department of Finance is due to provide interim findings in respect of fraud and error in September, with a final uh, report due in October and the 2019 official error report should also be available at that time. Um, so if members are content, there are some areas that just want to request further information. It's outlined at paragraph 3 and 4 of the clerk's memo, um, and if we can seek that information, if there's any further information members want to request, then we will consider it whenever we get the uh, information and decide if there's a course of work to do thereafter. Members content. Item yeah. 9, penalty notices for disorder. Changes to departmental guidance. The Minister has written to advise that her officials have worked in conjunction with the PSNI and the PPS to review the Department's guidance in relation to the penalty notice scheme that was introduced in the Justice Act 2011. While the types of offences to which penalty notices for disorder can be applied is set out in statute, the related guidance sets out thresholds in relation to some of these offences and has not been updated since 2011. The Minister has approved a revision of the guidance to extend the use of PNDs. The changes are outlined in her letter on page 480 of the meeting pack. A copy of the revised guidance with the changes highlighted has also been provided by the Department. 
Officials took on board the views of victim support when progressing this work, and the ministers contend the proposals provide a proportionate disposal option and are set at a realistic uh, level. So, members, it's whether you're content to note the changes um, on the department's guidance in relation to penalty notice schemes that were introduced in the 2011 Justice Act, or if further information is needed. Rachel. Thank you, Chair. Um, just in terms of um, on page, it's a, uh, a minister's letter, page 40, it said the officials took in on board the views of victim support Northern Ireland in this work. Um, I, unless I'm not saying it, but I didn't see any of the views written down, so I just would like to know what the views of victim support were on this one. Um, and also, is there any um, any uh, detail of when this is going to come in? You know, is it, is this happening next month, or does it? You know, is it is it from now? Okay. Yeah, we'll find out that information. Okay. Item ten: closure of COVID nineteen interim payment scheme for legal aid suppliers. The Department has provided further information on the COVID-19 interim payment scheme for suppliers who undertake legal aid work and the rationale for the decision to close it without any extension on the 7th of August. So it's their members for information. Item 11, Recruitment and Retention Allowances for County Court Judges. It's a written paper. The Minister is seeking the approval of the Executive for the payment of her recruitment and retention allowance to eligible County Court Judges in Northern Ireland for the financial year 1st of April 2019 to 31st of March 2020. Um, the Lord Chancellor is responsible for determining salaries and pensions of the Court Judiciary in Northern Ireland. Um, these are matters that are not devolved to the Assembly. Payments are made from the Northern Ireland Consolidated Fund on the basis of the Lord Chancellor's determination. Earlier this year, the Lord Chancellor made two determinations in relation to a recruitment and retention allowance which affect High Court and County Court judges in Northern Ireland. Uh, while the determination in relation to High Court judges has been actioned by the Department, there is no statutory basis for the payment of a recruitment and retention allowance to County Court judges. The Department has therefore sought advice from the Department of Finance, and because of the lack of specific statutory authority to make the payment, it is considered executive approval is required before uh, the allowance for county court judges can be made by the Department. Financial implications set at approximately £96,000 and will be funded from existing departmental budgets in the Department of Justice. So, members, it's there to note in terms of the position in respect of payment of recruitment and retention allowance for county court judges in Northern Ireland. Noted. Noted. Correspondence, four items of correspondence, pages 5529 to 565. Um, and also just to advise members, disregard correspondence cover memo in the pack and refer to the one that's at page 14 of your table pack. That was emailed to members yesterday for the proposed actions. I will just draw attention to a couple. Uh, item 3, Department of Justice's response from uh, justice agencies on findings and recommendations of the Criminal Justice Inspection, Northern Ireland Report on Child Sexual Exploitation. Currently, the Department is liaising with other departments and agencies before finalising the action plan to address the strategic recommendations and uh, provide a copy of the plan to the committee when that is available. The Police Service and Public Prosecution um, have prepared draft action plans to address the operational recommendations, and the Department will coordinate the response to these. So, members, when we get the uh, final plan, um, this will be an area that the committee will, will want to look at, and then we will um, take forward a course of work in respect of that once we receive the plan. Um, if members are consent, content. Item 4. Uh, there is an email from the Northern Ireland Judicial Appointments Commission uh, regarding rescheduling the engagement event that was planned for May 2020. It has been postponed due to COVID-19 restrictions. Um, NIJAC is looking at rescheduling the event in uh, May or June of 2021. Um, and obviously, then, uh, we can uh, consider our participation in that proposed event whenever we get the details mm -hmm. of it. Great. Okay. Okay, we'll action the other items as outlined in the clerk's memo. Mm -hmm. I have no business. Any other business? Linda? 
Two things. The first one is we talked last week, obviously, about moving the meeting to a Thursday afternoon if the ad hoc committee was no longer going to be happening. Um, we got confirmation that that is the case, so yeah. I was wondering if we can look again at that. Obviously, I know that probably the likes of the Chief Constable Hammond has already been arranged and, and tied in with his diary, and that's happened the 24th. So if the 24th, if we could agree the 24th would be the, the last date that we will do it in the morning. Um, I would much prefer it in the morning, to be honest with you, because it suits me better in terms of yeah. being home a wee bit earlier. However, it is it is really a struggle with trying to get all of the papers read and yeah. and get you know get views and, and I suppose to be able to fully scrutinise and participate in this meeting and do it in a, an effective way. Mm -hmm. it, it's just a tight timeline between you getting the papers and, mm -hmm. and being able to, to do this on a Thursday morning. I've been chatting to, to Christine about that in terms of how we manage it and um, my, from my understanding as well, I was speaking to some of the other officials, the speaker's letter and the ad hoc committee is going to the chairman liaison group um, which will then be looking at some of the issues around committees and timetabling and when they can take place and so on in, in light of that. So just think from a procedural perspective, it's going through CLG and that will inform them what we do but um, I hear what you're saying in terms I think, of... I think they're talking about meeting next week, isn't it, CLG? Ah, they it are, is next yeah. Week. It's next Tuesday, so yeah, okay, fair enough. Um, and just the other thing, I had forwarded a letter to the minister, um, myself, just in relation to people who are seeking a placement for legal studies this year, and I think they have to have had their placement confirmed by the end of September. I haven't got a response back in relation to that, but. Obviously, I think it is a concern mm -hmm. for us as a committee that, that we potentially will have um, people not getting a placement and that this could impact our, the future in terms of people being able to access legal um, representation. So I was just wondering if as a committee we could ask, we could maybe send that again from the committee and ask that a yeah. response come to the committee as soon as possible. Okay, well, would you just... Copy I can in. email it on to Christine and, and then, then take it from there, is that okay? I'm more than happy to lend the committee support to that if members are content. Then we'll, we'll do that. Thank you, Chair. No problem. Okay, um, notwithstanding the conversation around timetabling of this committee, and, and we'll come back to that um, in the very near future, the, the next meeting is scheduled um, Thursday the 17th at 10 a.m. It's in room 29 next week um, at Parliament Buildings. Okay. Members content. We'll adjourn. All right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, program signed. This is the Northern